Awesome. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. Welcome to the annual State of the Court. It's been a couple years since we've all been in a room together, so it's really nice to see those of you who are here in the auditorium, and I know there are many more of you in Zoom land, so thank you all for being here today. I'm Carrie Burns, I'm director of CLE here at the Bar Association, and because of that, I'm gonna give you your CLE information. For those of you on Zoom, um, please ask questions. Use the chat function. We have someone back there that will ask your questions to the judges up here this afternoon. And those of you in the audience, just raise your hand, but please wait for the microphone so that Zoom can hear the questions that you're asking. Um, each judge is gonna give about 10 minutes of presentation and we have reserved time for everyone to ask questions of each judge. Um, so um, be, be prepared with your questions at the end of the presentations. Today we have two moderators that are gonna kind of uh, go in tandem for our judges. Um, the first is Nick Vento. He's an associate attorney with Schneider Smelt Spieth Bell in the firm's litigation practice group, focusing on the areas of business, commercial, labor, and employment, estate and probate litigation. He's also the chair of our litigation section and why we asked him here today. Thank you, Nick. And Megan Connolly, she's a partner at Lowe Scott Fisher, where she focuses her litigation practice on personal injury, nursing home neglect, and wrongful death. She is a part of our um, lawyer referral service, and that's why I've asked Megan here today. So thank you both for being here, and we are going to go ahead and get started. Thanks, Carrie. Um, for our first speaker, I'd like to introduce Judge Leslie Ann Salobrizi. Uh, administrative Judge of the Cuyahoga County Domestic Relations Court. Judge Celebrezzi has served on the Domestic Relations Court since 2008, and uh, prior to election to the Domestic Relations Court, uh, Judge Celebrezzi served as a magistrate in the Cleveland Municipal Court. Thank you, good afternoon. Um, I'm Judge Leslie Ann Celebrezzi, and I have been the administrative judge for five years. And looking at this picture of the five judges, I realized that Judge Goldberg and I are very short. <laughs> so, <laughs> and the other thing is, I, this is the first time I've seen the PowerPoint as I was extremely busy with a lot of divorces since COVID, they backed up. So I think everyone here knows what domestic relations court does. Um, we handle divorces, disillusions, legal separations. Every once in a while we get an annulment, which those are always really fun. Um, and we also do our support custody and our civil domestic violence protection orders. Let's see if I can get this to move. Okay, I don't think anyone's interested in our mission, but you can do that quickly. So um, this is another slide regarding the services that we have. So, oh, I'm sorry, because I can't see the slide. So the services that the Domestic Relations Court offers right now, um, we've expanded a few of our programs, and I know that's gonna be on a later slide. Let's see if I can move it. Um, I guess we'll start with the pandemic response. So we were one of the first courts to do Zoom, thankfully. Um, it is, we still do Zoom for a lot of our disillusions and our uncontesteds. We are back to in-person for trials and uh, motion hearings. Um, I was interviewed by Cranes as one of the first courts to have the Zoom. Um, thankfully, I have a good administrative team and we piggybacked with General Division, who so graciously helped us to get our technology going. We are also part of the remote notarization program, which has gone fairly well. Um, it is hard for people to get notaries. And so we recognize that also during the pandemic as no one could get things notarized. So when they started this program, it has worked fairly well. I can't say it's worked great, but it has worked fairly well. Um, we're also involved in our online dispute resolution program. We're contracting with a company to see if that works and that helps a lot of our pro se litigants. We have a huge amount of pro se litigants in domestic relations court. We're also part of the access to fairness and justice study. Um, if you come to our court, we give you a QR code and you can tell us how we did that day and how you feel that we did in terms of access to justice. We don't have the results yet on that. I am curious to see how it worked, whether attorneys and litigants throughout the pandemic felt that they were being served better through the Zoom process, through technology, or if it ended up being more of a burden. So I think that's ultimately the question that the court has, and that's why I'm glad we participated in this study. We also are the only court in the state of Ohio to have the family's first program that was started by Judge Jones. Judge Jones has received a grant from the Adams Board three years in a row. She deals with the litigants that have 
excessive mental health and substance abuse problems. And so the goal of the court is to reunite people that have these issues with their families. She's been very successful in that program. She's helped, I know this microphone, I'm too close to the mic. She's helped approximately 50 families get through this program and it, it is an amazing program and we're very proud of her and the work that she does. And Judge Jones did come from a um, social worker background, so she adds that to the court, is that we're all not from the same backgrounds as um, in our court as everyone else. The other thing we did this year is we expanded our help center to what is called the Navigation Center. In domestic relations court, we have probably 75% of our litigants are pro se. And so my plea to the bar is, if you start doing unbundled, we would appreciate it. And if you give us a list of who does unbundled services, it would really help our court a lot. Um, the problem we have with the, with the pro se litigants is when they come into court, they don't know what they're doing. And so we get a lot of separation agreements and that are just not right. And it's hard for the court to deal with that. I mean, the Navigation Center helps. We take you from start to finish. And our goal is to cross train everyone. So everyone in the Navigation Center can assist with the domestic violence department, can assist with the help center, and can assist with what was enforcement services. So we have departments that assist with pro se's and then also our attorneys. So the navigation center, the purpose of that is to help everyone. So if you're a brand new attorney, you come into domestic relations court and you have no idea what to do, go to the navigation center and we will help you. That's the purpose of it. Once again, this is a part of technology. Um, we are one of the few courts in the state to do the, the Zoom. I know that was a big deal in the beginning of the pandemic. We happen to still do Zoom. It's, it's great for the attorneys, so they all tell me that they like doing pretrials and disillusions and uncontesteds via Zoom. They don't have to come to the courthouse. Their clients don't have to come into the courthouse and pay for parking. So we anticipate expanding that and keeping that technology going. I don't know if I... Um, so we have had a couple of changes. Judge Gold retired in January of 2021. She was on the bench for 10 years. She was the creator of the Help Center. She did a great job doing that. Um, judge Colleen Reale took her spot as the next judge. And we are an all-female court. We have been for approximately, I want to say 10 years. I don't know if we're the only all-female court in the state of Ohio. Um, Judge Jones was appointed trustee of the executive board for the Association of Domestic Relations Judges. I was an honoree of the Italian American women last year in March of 21. As you know, if you were here in June, Judge Reale did a view from the bench. Judge Goldberg was appointed to the, tech, the Commission for Technology. So Judge Goldberg is a huge proponent of technology. So her getting on that board is phenomenal. I think that's it for my slides. Sorry, I was, you know, I've had an extremely busy week. So this is unfortunately the first time I've had to look at my PowerPoint, and I apologize. So if, unless anyone has any questions, I can wrap up mine and get the next speaker up. No one ever wants to ask DR questions, do they? Any questions? We're good. Okay. Oh, there's oh, a question. We got one. So you said that there are a lot of pro se litigants. Is there anything like the uh, legal aid or anything that helps those who can't afford an attorney to, to get some help there? Or is it just through that uh, navigation center? Well, legal aid is normally only takes litigants that have domestic violence. So that's the problem. They're overburdened. Um, there has been discussions that I know some lawyers do on bundled services which is very helpful to us, but we need some type of list because not every attorney does that. And so you don't have to appear in the court. You could do the separation agreement and the judgment entry, and you don't have to appear on the hearing. So that way it's done correctly for pro se litigants. I mean, there are some people that are never gonna be able to afford an attorney and we're aware of that, but there is a middle class that needs an attorney and just sometimes don't know where to go. And so that's always the help that we want from the bar is give us a list of who does unbundled. And that would assist us greatly. 
Okay, I just want to ask a follow-up. I'm a brand new attorney, so I don't know what unbundled services means. I don't know if other people don't know or everybody knows, and it's just me, but figured I'd ask. I mean, I can't speak for the other courts, but in domestic relations, what unbundled would be is when you, you'd say we'll do a dissolution. So both parties agree to what, what they want their parenting plan to look like and their separation agreement, you know, who's getting the house, who's getting the retirement. So they try to construct that separation agreement on their own, and 10 times out of 10, it's really bad. And so as the judge, you know, I, I sit there and think, okay, I have this agreement in front of me, and there's always a list of questions from the navigation center. They've gone through it and said, judge, what do you want to do? Well, I want you to get divorced, but I know when I sign it, you're going to see my, you're going to see Pat Kelly. That's my post-decree magistrate. And there are some things that can't be undone in these separation agreements. So unbundled would be, you say, we charge $2,000 to do just the separation agreement and so it's done correctly. You don't have to appear for the hearing, and we know it's good to go. So that's unbundled. Um, I know that I'm going to say uh, Pete Kerner is going to kill me, but Pete Kerner is the one that did a CLE on it. So you might want to contact him because he can tell you more about it. But if you want to do it, that'd be great. So can I just take your name and I'll put you on the <laughs> list? And then like you'll get phone calls every day. <laughs> Any other questions? Do we have anything from Zoom or? No, DR, not very exciting. <laughs> Unless you're getting divorced, then you're then it's exciting. <laughs> then everyone wants to know your business, but okay. The, yeah, you never want to see. No one ever wants to see us. Is the other thing. All right. Well, with that, uh, thank, thank you, you, Judge Selvesi. <laughs>
So I know this means um, nothing to you, but if you have clients, they can fill the form out and submit it, and then the process is taken care of. You automatically get time to pay. You don't have to pay for that. You have 90 days to pay that, and you just hit, it has all, and it has your rights there, so we're not, by, you know, we're not, we're letting people know you do have rights, you don't have to do this, and you just hit submit, and then that comes to me. Another thing that's important for us regarding um, access to justice is for people to have access to the public defenders in our, in our court system. Prior to the pandemic, the individual who needed a lawyer would go to the public defender's office. When the pandemic happened, we were needing those individuals to make phone calls to the office so that um, they could, because the public defender was not accepting people to walk in. That became a little bit of a difficult process in terms of capturing those phone calls. So what we did is we put it on our website. So there's a place on our website where you can click request a lawyer, same fill in form, and that form goes directly to the public defender so that you can have access to a public defender. We actually also have in Cleveland Municipal Court, and we actually stole this off Judge Sheehan, he doesn't know it, I'm just revealing it right now. Um, we have places in our courthouse where there is a scan barcode, and that pulls up this form. If you know Judge Sheehan, you know he likes the scan barcode, the QRC code or the code. Um, we have that as well for the access to justice for the public defender. Obviously, the purpose of this is to kind of limit the um, acts, the limit the number of people who are coming into the justice center. Um, we're still doing zooms. We have barriers up um, in some of the places right now. Um, face masks are optional, but we, we're still making sure that we're being safe. We're doing a lot of video conferencing. Um, this is a lovely list of my colleagues, except I feel like it's not updated because Judge Groves is not there anymore. So that should be Judge Nelson Moore. But we have on our website that if you click on the name of the judge on the website, you automatically drop into our Zoom hearing. So you don't have to remember passwords and codes. You go to the website and you have a case scheduled for Judge Early. You go to the website, you click my face, probably not really my face, my name, and then you get put into my um, Zoom room. Don't try that because if you do it right now, I get a notice that you're sitting in my room because I'm not online, but when you do it, so it's, it's easy for us to have people remember their um, court appearances as opposed to saying my Zoom meeting number and password are whatever the password are. We send them to the website and say, just click on it. We also have a hotline as well. So if in fact they can't get in, we have a hotline where we have someone that mans the phone and then directs them to getting on Zoom for that. So, and again, we're, we're doing, um, a lot of things in terms of discovery, pre-trials, rescheduling of cases on video, but we are having in-person trials and jury trials. Uh, that's me, I'm glad you can't really see me, but that's, that's me. So um, our pre-trial services, which is a, uh, a pretty good department that we're, we're, that we're proud of in terms of the work that we've been able to do with this department, um, because we've been able to do two things that are very important to court, make sure that people come back to court, but also keep the community safe. And we're making sure that people are not um, unnecessarily incarcerated pretrial. So as you see, even during the pandemic, we still had a number of, um, we had 5,600 um, cases come through arraignment that had um, public safety assessments, which means offenses of violence. And then out of those people, which would be just the misdemeanor cases, uh, over 1,300 of those, we did pretrial service assignments with um, 824 GPS devices and then 542 people were just monitoring without GPS devices. Um, and trying to get a sweet spot balanced to where you have judges who initially, we don't really know um, the history of the pretrial services. You have some people who are everybody, you put everybody on GPS, which is not helpful, or you put no one on GPS. And we're trying to, at this point, because we've done it for a number of years, getting to the spot where some people need that um, GPS tracking and then some people don't. So we're at about 60% of the referrals are for GPS and then 40% are, are just for monitoring. Um, so 
the compliance numbers for 2021 are a little bit lower than we would like them to be because of the tracking the cases during the pandemic. It was actually pretty difficult to um, get cases in and out um, because of the uh, not having a lot of cases and cases being rescheduled. So our compliance, our failure to appear rate had it dropped. It was a little bit higher or a little bit lower before. Um, so we had 20, 25% of the people did not show up. Um, the 5% though is the number of people who picked up new cases while out on GPS. So that number is significant for us. And then the 4% would be other violations, which would be an exclusion zone violation or failing to come to court. We only had 4% of those. Um, well, they would be other than, so they would be an exclusion, exclusion zone violation would be the other ones. One of the other big things we're doing is our interpreter services. We had 21 languages come before the court in 2021. Um, so that's a, a big department for us. Specialized dockets, we have um, drug court, um, human trafficking docket, mental health, veterans docket. Some of the highlights, um, and I don't have a picture on it, but I participated in it. We had yoga in the park for drug court, an amazing program. Um, mental health docket had an art show. The veterans docket um, did the veterans parade. So there are over 300 people participating in our specialized dockets. We have a significant amount of grant dollars that helps with the specialized dockets. We also, in 2020 and 21, utilize state funding for additional computer um, technology upgrades. And this is probably the thing that has the bags currently under my eyes. We went live with Tyler, our brand new case management system, on Monday. So um, this has been a long time coming. I am happy to report that um, because of the pandemic, it took us a little bit longer to complete than we would have wanted, but we are not over budget. We actually may come in under budget, but I probably shouldn't have said that out loud, um, because then, because <laughs> then we won't, but we will not be over budget on this. And this is something that the team worked so hard for. We were, um, at work on Saturday and Sunday to get this done. So this is a huge accomplishment, um, for the staff and they did amazing for that. And that's my team. Thanks, Judge Early. So at this time, we can open to any questions. It's all on the website, so. <laughs> Back here, I see. Hi, just a quick question. Um, can you talk briefly about the integration of your data management system with other municipal courts so that it's easy to see if criminal defendants have cases in other municipalities so that you could better coordinate their pretrial services or their post-conviction probation and parole? So great question, and I don't think that we do that well as a uh, criminal justice partner with, you know, there are 13 municipal courts in the um, county, and then, you know, probably it's a little easier for common police court, Judge Sheehan and I, to coordinate because we're in the same building and we have a lot of meetings together. Um, the case management system doesn't necessarily um, communicate that with them, although there are other jurisdictions that were waiting for us to go live. Um, I believe Franklin County is, is util going to utilize Tyler, Akron Municipal Court is as well, but we were the first ones to kind of push it forward. Um, the hope is that, you know, there'll be some, you know, there is some requirements regarding sharing information to the Ohio Court Network. Um, but obviously it is a concern that we're kind of all utilizing something different. So, and, and we, we try to coordinate, but I, I, it's something that we need to do better on. Got another one down here, Judge. Uh, hi, Judge Early. So one of the questions I wanted to ask was, does the municipal court do anything with like data, data tracking or transparency to make sure things like bail and uh, sentencing are, don't have face like racial disparities or income disparities that we see in the criminal justice system a lot? So we don't have a, um, like a specific program that does that. The information is going to be captured in the new system. One of the um, issues with, um, the system that we had prior to going with Odyssey was that it was difficult to um, create reports. Um, and I'm not um, 
being negative with the old case management system. Part of it is, as everybody knows, is if you put garbage in the system, you get garbage out. So, I, you know, so I'm not going to um, pretend that it was all of them. A little bit of it was us as well that made it hard for us to get reports. So knowing that as an issue is something that we're um, attempting to do better here in terms of creating the ability to create reports um, so that we can capture a bunch of different things. And part of that is having the data, because you can run the report, but if the data is not being collected anywhere, you're never going to get the information that you need. I hope I answered your question. Can Any I call on, um, no, am I? I'm not calling on a people. You can call on someone. Absolutely. I was just kidding. I was going to call on this guy. <laughs> right. I'm like, anyone? are there any questions on Zoom? The next person has to be shorter than me. No. I think we're good. All right. Thanks, Judge Early. Okay, uh, for our next speaker, I'd like to introduce Judge Laura J. Gall or Laura J. Gallagher of the Cuyahoga County Probate Court. Judge Gallagher has served on the probate court since 2009, and prior to that, she served as a prosecutor in the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office and as a magistrate for the Medina County Juvenile and Probate Court. Judge Gallagher? Thank you. Hello. I've not done this particular presentation before, so hopefully I'm going to give you the information that you've been dying all day to hear. Um, if, if Judge Celebrezzi thinks domestic is not that popular, I have to wonder where probate falls in the scheme of things. Um, I'm tickled that I get to go before Sean Gallagher. I never get to do that. I'm always lined up way behind him. Uh, probate judges are actually always the bottom of the ballot as far as judges go, so it makes a pretty good uh, campaign slogan, like, don't give up, stay strong, keep voting, get to the bottom. But uh, I'm honored to be here. Uh, I'll share a little bit with you uh, about my court. I don't know if we have timekeepers, but uh, feel free to give me the hook if I, if I go too long. Uh, I don't have my PowerPoint today. I will tell you, if you like what you hear and you want to learn more, uh, I'll, I'll plug the uh, state planning section, uh, lunch, or well, it's not a lunch anymore, it's a Zoom, uh, on April 19th, and I'll be speaking for an hour. So if you're really want to know what probate court does, uh, that's in a couple of weeks. But uh, I, because most of you uh, probably don't practice in my court, I'll try to let you know things that everybody wants to know. Uh, so when your uh, neighbor calls or your second cousin and, you know, they have these questions, maybe you'll, you'll sound really smart. You'll know a little bit about what we do. So as you know, uh, primarily we administer estates. Uh, so, um, you know, Leslie said her, her court is boring unless you're getting a divorce. You almost have to be uh, dead uh, to come see us. Uh, sorry. But uh, that, you know, that's primarily what we do. But uh, also uh, a lot of really pretty amazing things. I get to do adoptions every Thursday and uh, not to brag, but there's nothing better. There's nothing any judge does, I think, that can be better than that. So I'm always appreciative when Thursday rolls around. Uh, we also do name changes. I'm going to touch a little bit on that because there's been a significant uh, change in how we do that. Uh, we uh, issue marriage licenses, which is fun. We occasionally do marriages. So uh, we also do, uh, you know, psychiatric. Uh, the, you, everybody knows about, you know, the probate uh, process of mentally ill. Uh, we have also got some pretty good innovative programs going in that arena. We do guardianships of, of minors and, and incompetent adults. So pretty good variety. I, I love where I am. I love what I do. I've learned to be very grateful these last two years instead of pondering everything I had to give up. Up. I finally plan a vacation and it doesn't happen and, you know, uh, trips to see my kids and all kinds of things like we all did. But I, I've become very grateful and really grateful for the staff at our court. Uh, we uh, really, like, like uh, my colleagues here, didn't really miss anything. I think we were truly shut down for about a week. Uh, if you haven't met my bailiff, Eddie, he's like my hero of all time. Uh, I was like freaking out about adoptions. Like everything else can get continued a little bit. Nobody's going to get too excited, but we don't continue adoptions ever. And I think we might have missed one week. And after that, we had everybody up on Zoom. Uh, there were obviously some compu complications, some concerns about confidentiality, but we worked through it. 
and uh, we have done a lot of adoptions on Zoom. It's not nearly as much fun as you know getting to hold children and hug new moms and dads, but it works, and they're getting their, their new names and their new birth certificates. Um, the highlight, I think, I, I did one on Zoom, and the little girl that was being adopted was three or four, and her entire preschool class got to participate on Zoom because the, they were all sitting on the mat, and they had the screen, and they were waving, and it, it was really pretty cool. So again, grateful for, for the good things that, that have come out of this, uh, this awful last couple of years. So we are open for business. Uh, we don't have nearly as much foot tra traffic as we had in the past. Um, traditionally in our court, attorneys and or unrepresented litigants would uh, come up to the second floor to see a magistrate if they had questions, if they needed help with a filing. We, we don't do that so much anymore. Um, a lot of what we do now is electronic. Uh, another thing that I am grateful for is our e-file team went from zero to 500. We were, we were doing e-filing, the system was in place, but we weren't taking e-file estates anything two years ago. And now almost everything can be e-filed in our court. It has been fabulous. Um, my favorite part is the way we do e-file, it's not like you fax in the thing and we print it out and then we're paper from there on. We have a pretty integrated system where if you e-file a motion, um, you know, I can set the hearing online, I can do the hearing online, I can do your entry online, and my bailiff can send it out to you online, uh, which means if it's like a really bad snow day, I can just get up and dress the upper half, do your hearing, do your entry, Eddie's down the street uh, docketing and sending it out, and nobody knows that we weren't at the courthouse. So, um, you know, gone are the days where I just take a day and I don't do anything because it's too tempting to go sign on and, and do what I need to do, but I can sign probably about 90% of what I need to sign in the way of orders, I can do electronically any time of day or night from anywhere. So again, um, I'm really grateful that we were set up to be able to do that. Uh, but you can come in, you can file in person, you can file e-file, you can file by mail, you can, uh, they, they asked me to say, uh, some attorneys were frustrated because if you came in, you know, sometimes attorneys, especially from the suburbs, want to file 10 things at once, and you weren't allowed to do that apparently in person because you held up the line. Uh, you can do that now. We're, we're pretty well staffed. You don't have to leave a stack and hope it, it finds its way uh, to the docket. Uh, we've really uh, found some efficiencies. So, so uh, you know, we're, we're uh, up and running everything we used to do, but also a lot more. Um, if, if you ever want to know anything about probate, go on our website and look at the e-file guide. Um, the head of our e-file department, uh, Terrence Huber, some of you have seen him speak before, absolutely amazing. These guides tell you everything you need to know about every case type that might have to get filed in our court and step-by-step -step walks you through it. Our name changes are, and our adoptions, quite frankly, are, are usually unrepresented litigants filing. They can figure it out. They can do it. It's easier than Zoom. So we get most of what we get now e-filed, and it's it's a good thing. It looks like I'm really efficient now. I used to have files all over my desk, and everybody knew how behind I was because you know here's this motion, here's this motion. It's all in my computer now. Nobody knows. My desk looks great, so it's a, it's a really good thing. Um, another uh, uh, judge early talked about you know the participation increase. Um, I do a lot of adult protective cases. It's kind of a precursor to a guardianship. It's a stopgap when somebody is self-neglecting or, or being exploited. Um, usually that was the social worker, maybe a family member, and me. So I'm making huge decisions about somebody's life, and I I can't lay eyes on them because they're in a nursing home or a hospital. I have almost 100% participation now. God bless the social workers and the nurses because regardless of the condition the person is in, they're there with a tablet, they're there with whatever it takes so that I can uh, see the person who's the subject of my order, uh, engage with them if they're able to. It's, it's really, uh, again, uh, the, the silver lining of, of what we've been through. Uh, we do have a resource center at our court now, uh, Monday through Thursday. Um, very simple matters, uh, the attorneys, we, we pay, uh, volu I'll say volunteer attorneys, we do pay them a little bit, it's not much, but they come in and do some office hours, help people. It, it's primarily for unrepresented, but I know that occasionally there's an attorney who just um, throws themselves at our mercy and says, I don't do probate, but this is for a friend or a family member, and we have attorneys that will talk you through the basics. Uh, we don't 
use that for adversarial cases. Obviously, we don't want to give anybody an advantage, but um, it is available uh, for, for basic questions. Uh, the Ohio Supreme Court just published a brand new, we're, we're the clerk of our own court, there's a brand new um, desktop guide for our clerks, which is wonderful, it's very thorough, it kind of clues them in to what we do, why we do it, and reminds them, please don't practice law, here's what information looks like, here's what legal advice looks like, and we did an online training last week, and the, the biggest comments that we got in the evaluation was, Thank you for telling us this is advice and this is information because we, we all see that and we need to, to be cautious about that. Um, I'm not gonna get into really uh, a lot of the nuts and bolts, but there's always legislation affecting our court. Uh, something that you all might be interested in, uh, the name change process in Ohio used to be a bit cumbersome. You would uh, file an application for a name change, it had to uh, be published, so you couldn't get your hearing until we did publication, a little bit of expense. Um, then you would have to come in for a hearing in person. Uh, there was a change to the statute primarily because of this compliant uh, ID thing with the, you know, the federal government for flying and so forth. So uh, Judge Dunn in Greene County, uh, Judge O'Diam, probate judge, said let's simplify this. So now you almost never have to go to court for a hearing for a name change unless there's like some red flags that go up. You have to sign an affidavit that says you're not changing your name for fraudulent reasons and you, know, you don't have certain crime, criminal history. But we also do this like now, it's a name conform. So it's not a name change where you're getting a new birth certificate and changing everything. It's like you were born uh, Sally Rose Day, but you never went by Sally Rose Day. Uh, you got a nickname when you were a kid and you've always gone by the other name. So that's on some of your documents, but your birth certificate doesn't match. So you try to get this compliant driver's license and they're like, no, 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 nothing matches. There's a fairly simple process for uh, application to conform a name, no hearing, no publication, relatively quick and easy, and no hearing, and we issue the order. So that's just some general information. Uh, we do have our own local rules. A lot of practitioners don't know that, and it comes up in a bad way. It's usually in a discovery dispute where people are papering me and saying, you violated rules such and such. I'm like, I don't even know what that rule is. It's Sheehan's rule, it's not my rule, and I don't really care about it so much. Uh, so. so. So just know that we do have our own probate rules, uh, uh, local rules, and uh, we try to follow those. Um, and I know I'm running out of time. I just want to throw out there, keep your eyes open. Um, I'm on the uh, Rules of Practice Commission for the Supreme Court. Uh, the, the Chief Justice initiated an I, I court task force, I think that's what it was called, Let's use the best of what we learned during COVID and incorporate that uh, going forward because the attorneys in my court, for the most part, love the Zoom pretrials. We can do a 10 or 15 minute pretrial. It used to be an hour process to get down there, wait, come in. So um, there's uh, several, several changes to the civil rules and rules of evidence that are on file with the legislature. They've been out for two rounds of comments. They've been approved by the commission and by the justices. Unless somebody pulls one of these before, uh, I think it's the end of June, these rules will go into effect July 1st. Um, what we were doing is kind of, you know, finding our way through COVID and it's like, I don't know if I'm allowed to really swear you in over Zoom. I don't know if this is okay. Judge Groves and I really bonded early on because we were trying to figure out, like, can we do a wedding on Zoom and like, can the groom and the bride be in two different places and can they be out of our jurisdiction? And, you know, we were kind of winging it. These rules are going to make it clear that we can uh, administer oaths for people who are out of state. We can do even civil jury trials on, on Zoom or on uh, some kind of uh, electronic means if everybody agrees. The judge ultimately gets to decide if something is in person or if it's uh, electronic, but these rules cover us uh, to reassure us that we're not uh, going beyond what we're permitted to do. I think I'm probably out of 10 minutes, am I? <laughs> okay, I'll stop and see if anybody has any. And again, if you want to hear more about this wonderful uh, probate court, I am doing a, an hour presentation uh, on uh, April 19th, so. Any questions? Okay. I'm waiting for the hard one from the new lawyer. <laughs> Stumped you, good. All right, come back on April 19th. Okay. All right, thank you, Judge Gallagher. Thank you. Okay, next we are gonna welcome to the stage Judge Sean Gallagher. 
and Judge Sean Gallagher is our current administrative judge of the 8th District Court of Appeals. He was elected to this position in 2002. Prior to that, he served as a judge on the Cleveland Municipal Court, and prior to that, he was a felony prosecutor for Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it was hard for me to remember who I was following because I was going after Gallagher. <laughs> But uh, it's very much an honor to uh, be afforded this opportunity. And I, I thought I would start out with a little story about uh, a lawyer who tragically passed away. And when he went up to heaven, he must have been a Catholic because he was greeted by St. Peter. And uh, when he got there, uh, St. Peter took him to where his accommodations would be. And he was really disappointed. He looked around and said, gee, this is horrible. This looks horrible. I, I was looking forward to my life in eternity. And uh, St. Peter said, well, you can always appeal. And uh, the guy said, well, you know what? I am going to appeal. And St. Peter said, well, it's going to take about three years to get to your appeal. And the lawyer looks, three years to have an appeal? you got to be kidding me. And all of a sudden, the devil appeared. And the devil said, hey, we can hear your appeal in two hours. But you got to apply for a change of venue to hell. <laughs> so... The lawyer thinks for a minute and he says, really, I can get an appeal heard in hell in two hours and I got to wait three, three years in heaven? And the lawyer says, so what's the deal? He goes, well, we have all the appellate judges in hell. <laughs> so not really true, but, uh, but yeah. <laughs> well, if you ask the trial judges, they, they would say that's true. <laughs> no, but seriously, um, I don't have a PowerPoint, and I'm kind of glad I don't. Uh, not that I'm taking anything away from those that do, but I, I really am uh, very proud to say I think the 8th District has probably the most transparent and uh, technologically friendly court you would ever imagine. Uh, all of our stuff is online immediately. Uh, we, you can go online today and read the cases we released today. They're all available to here. We have electronic filing. We do everything like that. Uh, We've changed a number of things during the pandemic that I think are very positive. In fact, one of the things I want to mention is a lot of inmates in prison will, will appeal things and they would wait for weeks and months wondering what, what happened. Did My lawyer didn't call me. I, I don't know what happened. We now have a video feed right into the prison system. Defendant comes in. He's right in front of three Court of Appeals judges. He gets to make his argument or listen to his argument. Or So it's kind of a, a, a wonderful change that's happened. I do want to mention that uh, two administrators are here, and uh, our court administrator, Aaron O'Toole, I know I'm going to ask you to stand up. I know the people on Zoom may not see you. Aaron O'Toole and Bridget O'Brien, and I know this sounds like a South uh, Boston law, uh, no, a South Boston labor union, Gallagher, O'Toole, and O'Brien, but they are fantastic. They've run our court day to day and have made all the changes. Pretty much anything any practitioner would need is on our website. You can call the court if you don't know something. We have staff attorneys available to walk you through the procedural processes. It, it's a very, very up-to-date court. We try to help everybody. We've changed our local rules this year to allow you, and I believe this sincerely, that we serve, the appellate level particularly serves, yeah, we serve the community, but who we really serve are the lawyers that serve that community. So we've made it available now. If you want to come in live and in person for a hearing, come on in live. We're going to hear your hearing in person. You want to do it on Zoom? We'll let you do it on Zoom. You want to do it just by submitting on briefs? We'll let you do it. Submit it on briefs. We're going to follow your lead, and we really insisted that it was you, the, the attorneys, the lawyers, that would dictate how we do our hearings going forward. So you you control that. All you have to do is apply, and you get it. So it's kind of a nice thing. I have a couple other things quickly just to, to touch on. Um, I, want, I personally wanted to go to full video hearings and put them online, but right now they are audio, and that's as a result of a change in the appellate rules. You can go online and, and access the audio. I, I hate to think we're like the U.S. Supreme Court. We don't want video, but I, I think I do personally, but uh, one day that might happen. Um, there's a whole lot of other things that I could go on and on on about, but uh, I do, I should mention we have three new judges since the pandemic. Uh, the newest judge is Cornelius J. O'Sullivan. I, I kind of refer to him as CJO, and those of you that practice in appellate work know that CJO means concurrent judgment only. 
Uh, he doesn't just concur in judgment only, but uh, that's kind of his nickname. Also, uh, Judge Emanuela D. Groves and Judge Lisa B. Forbes are two new judges. So 25% of our court changed during the pandemic, and it's a, it's a significant change. We sit in panels of three, so we have to get along. And I'm very proud to say uh, the judges on our court, we really do. Even when we disagree legally, we work together and make it our mission to work together and get along. Um, and that's one last thing I want to say about the pandemic. We're all in love with technology because of the pandemic, and I am too. I like the Zoom. I like the e-filing. But I want to tell you. I want to tell you a little story in the two minutes I have. Right? Okay. So here, here's something to think about for people in the legal community. So I had a case a couple weeks ago, and I thought about it, and. Uh, it was a guy who committed a horrible act uh, and needs is in prison, needs to be in prison, and should be in prison. And that's just not the former prosecutor in me. That's the facts of the case. He had his initial appearance by Zoom. He had, I think, four or five pretrials by Zoom. He had his plea by Zoom. And he had his sentencing by Zoom. And he got like 25 years. So we had a situation as a result of the pandemic where, uh, and I'm not criticizing this, I'm just saying it's something for us to think about long term. We had a defendant who ended up in prison for 25 years and never was face to face in the same room with the person uh, dealing with his case or sentenced him. And I, I mean, I know I'm in love with technology too. I like it. I, I carry this little thing around with me all the time, you know, and it, I can't get along without it. But uh, at some point, though, I think we do have to balance that and, and assess that as we go forward. And that's why I like that the Bar Association always seems to be on the cusp of all these things. So I got to leave you with one other short thing that, uh, that I saw in a transcript and how it ended up on the transcript, I don't know. But it was a criminal lawyer, and he was talking with his defendant. And uh, he said, hey, I have some, have some good news, and I have some bad news. And, the defendant says, well, give me the bad news first. And the lawyer says, okay, well, the bad news is they have your blood, it's all over the crime scene, and the DNA matches, it proves you did it 100%. And the defendant says, what's the good news? And the lawyer says, your cholesterol came in at 128. <laughs> so I thank you very much, and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. I'm in trouble. Judge, I just want to know what your real feelings are about the Reagan Tokes law, if you have a few <laughs> minutes. We could spend quite a time on Reagan Tokes. For those, those of you that don't know, Reagan Tokes was a young uh, student at Ohio State University who was brutally murdered uh, several years ago, and the legislature passed a new sentencing law around it. And uh, uh, it was a tragic, tragic story of her fate and her family persevered and had basically advocated for a change in the law. And I think in principle, the change in the law was good. But if you tried to read this law, I would rather have to take a physics exam at Harvard University than interpret I, this law. I, I just want to say, obviously, the, the, the underlying issue with Reagan Tokes is very concerning to anybody. But the real issue is, or not issue, but we should be applauding this judge here, is he took on the state of Ohio and all of us judges and that law, being a court of appeals judge, and try to educate all of us about reading it and how we handle it on the docket and how we handle it in the courtroom. And he's been wonderful. Just so you know, the Ohio Judicial Conference has looked to him to teach us to make sure that we can understand it. So I was only pulling his, uh, his chain a little bit because he is so well respected in the state of Ohio for, for helping us. So judge, I, I, you know I'm kidding you, so. Yeah. Well, you Thank were kidding you. me about all that praise, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Judge. Thank you very much. I, no, no questions? Huh? Let's see. Maybe we'll just take one second to see if there's any more Oh, questions. we have the, oh, the new lawyer I, question. I love this guy. This guy's my favorite guy. <laughs> So I'm going to ask you, uh, Judge Gallagher, a similar question to what I asked Judge Early. You bragged about the transparency of, of your court, and that's great because we always want the, the courts to be transparent. But do you have data to, to show whether or not your court is, is and, and the judges on your court are, are making decisions that are equitable or they're making decisions that have some sort of racial or, or bias based on income? Well, we, we, we uh, like I say, we release everything. It's published online. Uh, I guess it's hard to quantify something like an appellate decision, uh, you know, by race or gender, but it's there, and I, I suppose 
someone could critique us on it. Uh, one of the nice things about sitting with panels of three, and I think we, for a state appellate court, we're probably the most diverse court in Ohio. We have uh, nine women, three men, three African Americans. Uh, you know, it's different than a lot of other courts. But to answer your question, I think, uh, you know, if we could quantify that, the nice thing I think is we check each other. You know, I sit with African American female judges, and I'm a 66 year old white guy, if you didn't know. <laughs> So I mean, I think, and I think it's healthy to have those discussions. And I think uh, that's one of the problems with data. We don't have that data. You know, it's not collected. You know, I, I want to answer your question one other way. When I was back in the prosecutor's office, and before that, I was a probation officer and a bailiff in the 1980s. Uh, we missed the chance to have a unified court system. And had we had a unified court system, that is, like the question earlier about to judge early about the 13 other municipal courts, and, or 12 other in hers. But if we had that unified court system where we could interact you know, and get data, get information, it would have been a lot easier to have this kind of information today. We don't. Every court system buys its own software computer system. They don't talk to each other necessarily. It's, you know, it's, it's completely different, which, which makes answering your question that much more difficult, unfortunately. And that's, that's as, about as honest as I can be. So if we could go back in time, having a unified court system would have really changed things. But so I, I, I appreciate that question, though. I like that. I like that you're young and you're, keep asking those questions. That's good. Thank you. Thanks, Judge. OK. All right. Uh, Last but not least here, I'd like to call Judge Brennan Sheehan to the stage. Last? No, I got what, one, one more. Oh, I'm sorry. Last the two, for me. The two best I'm for sorry. last, right? Second to last. Um, judge, uh, judge Sheehan is the administrative and presiding judge for the Cuyahoga County Court of Common Pleas. He has served on the Com Court of Common Pleas since January 2008, and he was elected to serve as the administrative and presiding judge effective January 2020. Prior to assuming the bench, Judge Sheehan practiced as a civil and criminal litigator for 14 years. Judge Sheehan? Thank you. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here. Um, and it's always fun to follow Sean. Seems like I do this my entire career. Sean first was the bailiff for Judge Nugent, and then I was the bailiff after Sean. So I get to follow him. But you could see uh, Sean's trying to look like a beetle these days. And I, I, always, I always enjoyed his haircut. Um, on behalf of my 33 colleagues, and I know some of them are here in the audience, um, approximately 500 employees, our court administrator, who's here in the audience, Greg Pop Popovich, our deputy court administrator, uh, Andrea Canast and Chris Russ, Darren Toms, our public information officer. Um, it's an honor for me to be able to stand here and tell you about our court. Um, and the state of our court. Um, but before I do that, um, I'd like to start this presentation by taking a moment uh, to remember Judge Nancy McDonald and Judge Joe Russo. We lost uh, Judge Nancy McDonald in September 28th of last year. As many of you know, uh, she served more than a decade on our bench after a double lung transplant. Judge McDonald holds a special place in our court, um, our court history. Um, she's the first woman to serve as the administrative and presiding judge of our court. Um, after Judge McDonald passed, less than a week, um, we learned of this passing. Um, we suffered another loss, um, and that is the loss of Judge Joe Russo um, on October 2nd. Uh, judge Joe Russo was a mentor to many young lawyers, he, he worked closely with the Bar Association, and we miss seeing uh, Judge Joe. Um, I wanna thank Judge Richard McMonigle and Judge Tim McGinty, who served as visiting judges after the losses of, judge, uh, uh, of the judges. Uh, judge Kenneth Callahan was appointed uh, by our Governor DeWine uh, to Judge McDonald's seat, and then Judge Wanda Jones returned to our bench when the governor appointed her to Judge Russo's seat. Um, 
In 2021, we also, um, one of the last acts of 2021 was a retirement, one of our favorite judges, and that's Judge Dick Ambrose. Uh, Judge Ambrose served our court for many years, and even though his term had not yet expired, Judge Ambrose told us he wanted to step down on his own terms. You see, when he played for the Cleveland Browns, uh, he was going to retire, but they made he got cut instead of retiring. So he said he wanted to retire on his own terms. Uh, so we miss Judge Ambrose. We miss his guidance and his, his partnership on the bench. But Governor DeWine appointed Judge Mark Major to fill Judge Ambrose's seat. So are we back to normal? <laughs> uh, yes, no. Uh, kind of in a new normal. Uh, there is no longer, if those of you who are in the audience remember hearing Judge Sheehan's matrix, uh, there's no more matrix system, and that's where we would have judges uh, request trials and we put them on a matrix list. Um, but we do have um, judges make requests for jury trials the day before the trial is set. Um, some um, end up being continued. Uh, most of them uh, go on, and some get settled. But I'm proud to say, even on Monday, this past Monday, we had 54 jury trials set on Monday, and we got to all 54 judges who had those trials set. So the jury trial system is working. Um, it's great to have everyone back in our office. Um, we've learned uh, that remote working is possible over the last two years, but it's not ideal. Um, we are, after all, as I tell all our employees, we're public servants. Um, if, God forbid, we have another pandemic or some COVID-related spike, we know what our options are. Also, I have to say, it is so nice to see everybody's face again. Uh, we're encouraging, uh, we, we withdrew having to wear masks in the courthouse, um, but we're encouraging frequent hand washing and hand sanitizing, and everyone say, why not, right? Um, remote hearings um, have truly been very, have, have really increased access to justice, just as Judge Early said. By having this option, we don't have people uh, missing work, leaving their kids, trying to get a ride down, getting transportation issues. Um, they don't have to find a ride. Um, we acknowledge that not everyone has access to Zoom uh, technology, but holding remote hearings is at the discretion of all of our trial judges. However, we encourage, and we've been encouraging that option for each of our courtrooms. Um, if you go to our courtroom, you will see each courtroom is equipped with a large mondo pad. I mean, super, super large mondo pad and auto technology. So people can be heard, lawyers can be heard, people could be seen on these mondo pads. They're a permanent fixture, and I hope Zoom he hearings continue to be a permanent uh, fixture. So, changes post-COVID. As you can see now, um, we're keeping our elevators at six uh, per, per elevator. Um, this decision, like all the decisions made during COVID, were made with the input of all of our Justice Center partners. Uh, Judge Early, myself, um, the prosecutor's office, the public defender, the clerk's office, the sheriff's department, um, the Cleveland Housing Court. Um, all of it has been made as partners. Post-COVID, um, it seems that still not many people are still comfortable being on an elevator with more than six people in there. Um, and, you know, will this change? Possibly, but right now it, it's still at six. There remains uh, one entry into our Justice Center, and that's on Ontario Street. Um, this is partly due to the lower than optimal staffing by the Sheriff's Department. However, um, Justice Center badge holders, uh, including attorneys with pass cards, can now enter through the Lakeside uh, Courthouse entrance, and all people can exit on the Lakeside Courthouse. Now, while COVID numbers are down, we still have people who choose to wear masks. And we have, thanks to Greg Popovich, we have large supplies of masks, face coverings. So if you ever need a face covering, or we ever have a spike in COVID numbers, we go right back to face coverings. We're ready for it. Um, and that's, again, thanks to all the work that we've done uh, preparing for this. Now, um, the large screens in our courtrooms, uh, not just used by the judge, they can be used by attorneys. 
Um, I just had a trial uh, Monday where the lawyers were so happy they didn't have to bring in their own little screens and their own little PowerPoint stuff. Everything was there. All they did is uh, they uh, put it on their Mondo pad and it was, it was screened up there. They loved it. And the jurors like it too because it's very good quality. So um, one thing about jurors, and I mentioned that, is that our global center for um, health and innovation is now on the fourth floor. We're bringing our new jurors in there. We have a call-in jury system that jurors love. All our jurors are called every day. When their number is called, they come down and report, and they report to the fourth floor of the Global Center. Um, this is a great staging area. The area is so large, it, it, it's, uh, it's unbelievable. And we've gotten nothing but great reviews from our jurors. Once their number's called, they come to the fourth floor, the bailiffs for the judges bring them over to the Justice Center, and uh, they're prepared for their trial, and everything's back to normal when they're in the Justice Center. Um, I had one juror just this day, I, I put this in there, uh, they reminded them, that's how big our fourth floor is, I don't know if you can see that, uh, that's the last scene from the Raiders of the Lost Ark, so uh, that's how big, that's how big our global center is. Um, criminal and civil jury trials. We are, uh, as I said, retaining the jury call-in system, so if you're summoned, you'll get uh, that night before, you'll call, if your number's there, you should need to report to the Justice Center or to the Global Center now. Um, one thing I'm proud about during the pandemic, our safety measures met and even exceeded our expectations. We know of no person who contacted COVID as a result of a trial or a hearing that was happened in our Justice Center. I cannot credit Public Works, our staff, everyone for that. Um, everyone did an amazing job. And it, gave our jurors confidence to show up and do their civic duty. Um, you heard me talk about that matrix page. I thought I'd show you what that looked like. This was the Sheehan matrix page. Um, what we used to do is schedule trials during COVID by this matrix. Um, their cases were prioritized based on the, the time uh, the case was pending, if the individual was in jail, how long the case had been pending for. If the scheduled case would, uh, would settle, then the jury would be used for the next case. Um, and that's how it was used in the matrix. By the time we got rid of this matrix system, I, it was like playing craps. It was unbelievable. We had the back line there. We had people saying, if I have a straight, can I go on this line? It was unbelievable. We ended up getting 50, uh, 50, 55 on a day on that matrix. So that's when I said, wait, this matrix has to stop. And uh, our bench, all, our judges all agreed. Uh, let's change it to the call-in system and all the judges schedule their own trials. We have the ability to bring in jurors for each judge's case. All right, um, let me see where else I'm going here. Um, jail population. Uh, in November of 20, we quietly instituted bail reform in our court. Nonviolent, low-level felony threes, F4s, F5s were given the presumption of a personal bond. That's the presumption. We've expanded our GPS numbers in our, for individuals who were pending cases in our court to 625 GPS units. And we don't have a wait list for people to get a GPS unit. Um, I continue to hold weekly meetings with our Justice Center uh, stakeholders to discuss the jail population. Um, and ideas for keeping the numbers low, as well as to discuss ideas how to better move cases and flow inmates through our system. One thing um, uh, Judge uh, Early and I both have been working on, um, and well, the Diversion Center, that's something that the county has been working diligently on. And the Diversion Center, I know um, new Mayor Bibb has told us that he wants to make it clear that he wants Cleveland to use that Diversion Center. And um, we're, we're looking to see how that data shows and affects our jail population. So we're, we're really anxious to see that. Um, in May, you know, I joke, my wife is Michelle and my second wife is Judge Michelle Early because she's in meetings with me every day, it seems like. Uh, we are, we've been in meetings weekly about central booking. And our new central booking facility will go live in May. Um, we, we were lucky enough, Judge Early and I, 
we're lucky enough to speak here on a hot topic about central booking. If you're interested in central booking to see how it's gonna go, it's gonna go live in May, but I know the Bar Association did a hot topic on it. It's a great, great program. Um, I enjoyed it. Um, it was hosted by the bar. I think John Mitchell was the MC, and Bob Corey was there. So if you want some entertainment, let's tune into that and look at that, all right? Um, now, you know, I, I'm laughing because Judge Sean's like, I don't need any PowerPoint. I'm looking at that, and you're like, what the heck is this? Um, we continue to prioritize cases in which the defendant is in jail. Many had to wait during our trial uh, for trial because of COVID. I want to uh, point out that early in the pandemic, we did everything in our power to reduce the jail population. We went from around 2,000 inmates uh, right at the height of the pandemic to 900 inmates. And people are like, well, how did you do that? We didn't just open up the jail and say, okay, go out in the streets of Cleveland or the city. No, what we did is we resolve cases. And people are like, why can't you do that now? Well, because during the pandemic, no one was going to bars, the streets of Cleveland were closed, people were quarantining in their house. That's how we were able to get it to 900, okay? Um, so that's, that. unfortunately, the world didn't stop again. And, and we, every time we get rid of cases, new cases are coming in. Um, but we, I'm proud to say that we have been able to maintain the jail population 600 inmates less than it was pre-COVID. And how did we do that? Well. I, I just like to show you, these are the, this is the numbers of folks that's in our jail. As of April 4th, there are 421 felony ones sitting in that county jail. Um, those are your rapes. Those are your high degree felonies. 250 felony twos, those are your felonious assaults. Um, there are 216 unclassified felonies. People are like, what does that mean? Those are murders. 216 individuals waiting trial for murder is in our jail. Um, we have 184 felony threes. Those are domestic violence cases. Um, we have 85 F4s and only 49 F5s. And those 49 are cases where there's holders because of parole. So you look at those numbers, what has that done? Our bail reform has reduced the individuals who are sitting there on low level felonies. The people who are in our county jail today, which is 1600 today, is because of high degree felons. And that's who's in our county jail. I mean, those are the people probably who should be in our county jail right now. So um, I wanna thank um, uh, Judge Maureen Clancy and the, uh, the CBCF board for working hard to try to help reduce the pressures on the jail. So judges in our bench who sentence people to the county jail on misdemeanor offenses can now be sent to the CBCF, which is the Nancy McDonald Center, so they can serve their sentence at the CBCF rather than being in the county jail. And that's the hard work of our CBCF folks. And I wanna thank the leadership of Judge Clancy on that. All right, pending criminal cases. So at the end of 2021, we had 5,512 pending criminal cases, a significant increase from the first year of COVID in 2020. We've not seen that number for some decades. During COVID, grand juries continued to meet and our judges were still able to maintain the jail population that allowed for treatment and isolation of COVID cases, which just complements the 34 judges on our bench. Um, I mentioned grand juries. Grand juries, as I noted before, continue to meet in the Global Center, and our grand jury uh, voir dire is held over there too. So if you know any of your friends, families who get on grand jury, it's over at the Global Center. So where are we now? Well, we went from 8,806 criminal filings in 2020, that's the first year of COVID, to 12,398 in 2021. 2021 was much more in line with filings over the last decade. Terminations, um, I'm pleased with the number of cases that we were able to terminate during 2020, uh, during the heart of the pandemic. In 2021, we were pretty close to the annual average of the last six years or so. So judges are trying to move cases. What about the civil docket? What's going on there? 
I think you'd be impressed to know there were 15,283 new filings in 2021 and 17,357 terminations that same year. I'm proud of our judges, our staff attorneys, our staff who helped wrapping up more cases that came in during the COVID year. Um, we now, as I said, have large Mondo pads, audio equipment in the courtroom that can be accessed for lawyers during litigation. We've added new attorney chairs and video mon monitors for cases referred to visiting judges at the old courthouse. Our visiting judges continue to hear civil cases and at the request of this bar, um, we actually requested another visiting judge by the Supreme Court to help us with the backlog of cases. Um, we finished installing new jury chairs in the uh, court in our in our main courtrooms. We've also upgraded the jury chairs in the jury seating area, and you will be sad to know that those yellow and blue and green and purple chairs that are in our courtrooms. There, we're working to get those gone, and we're going to have new gallery seating in the back of the courtroom. Yes, it's removable, but yes, we have gallery seats there. Um, uh, I'm also, I have to say, um, we're very thrilled uh, with our ADR and our dispute resolution department. Um, that's going strong. We were thrilled to add former Judge Rob McClellan to our staff of mediators last year, and we appreciate the, the members of the CMBA who volunteered as mediators during COVID, during the last two years to help us solve and resolve mediate cases in our, in our courts. All right, specialty dockets. I don't wanna shortchange our specialty dockets. Um, specialty dockets are great, great things in our court. And I wanna, if, I don't, if you don't mind, can I talk a little bit about that? I'll give you one more minute, but I did hear we have Zoom questions, so okay, we want to get to the audience. All right. Well, I'm going to finish first. Drug courts. Uh, <laughs> drug courts are Judge Dave Mattia, Judge Kellyanne Gallagher, Judge Joan Sinnenberg, um, and this doc. These drug courts are great. They're really working hard, and uh, we know Judge Billy McGinty is going to be our fourth drug court. We have the MHDD dockets. Um, which is co-chaired by Judge Holly Gallagher and Judge Shannon Gallagher, along with Judge Dina Calabrese um, and Judge Michael Shaughnessy. We added a fifth judge to that docket. Currently now is Emily Hagan. And last year, we want to thank Judge Deb Turner for stepping up and helping out in that docket. We have the high-risk domestic violence docket. That's chaired by Judge Sherry Madej. We have Veterans Treatment Court which is chaired by our very own Judge John Russo, who's sitting back here today, and that's been a great docket. We have the commercial docket, which is cares for all the civil litigation cases, and this bench and this CMBA argued hard for this commercial docket. And we have judges Nancy First, Cassandra Collier-Williams, Peter Corrigan, and Michael Russo working on that. We have a reentry docket, which is chaired by Judge Nancy Margaret Russo, and we have a specialty pilot program called the Violence Intervention Docket, which is close to my heart. I oversee it. If you want to hear about it, I'll let you know about it later, all right? Um, we also have the future of the jail and the Justice Center. Um, our steering committee uh, is considering um, a site for a new jail. Um, voting was to happen earlier this week. We went into executive session. We didn't come out of executive session, and we're going to continue to talk about that. Um, as for the Justice Center, I have been assured um, that there is going to be money for a, either a new justice center or a rehabilitated justice center. Um, and we, we have not been forgotten. And that's been part of my uh, march, marching orders to make sure we're not forgotten as a justice center partner. Um, I want to end real quick. Um, I, I always joke my friend John Russo, Judge John Russo, uh, he was the administrative judge before me. Um, we both started our respective terms as administrative judge. Um, we each had at least some hair, and it was dark. Now, I can honestly say for sure, this is exactly what, I'm not sure, but this is what we looked like when we started, but this is what we look like now as administrative judges. So uh, the job is not an easy job, um, as there's a lot of stress, but it, it, it's important, and I, it's an honor to be able to he stand here today and speak on behalf of my bench. Thank you. All right, do we want to take a Zoom question first? Okay. Probably have one for time for two questions. Okay, the first one was, 
What has the court learned from the experiences during COVID of releasing people pre-trial without cash bail? Um, we've well, we've been studying uh, the bail, the releasing without cash bail um, on personal bonds, and we've been learning and we've we studied it. So far, individuals are showing up to court. Um, their appearance rates are up, and we're looking forward to seeing. Hopefully, knock on wood, it continues that way. Um, Right now, um, it has been uh, an amazing process for us when we see, uh, it, it just shows the naysayers, hey, it does work. People just need to be told. We started a texting message program out of our arraignment room to remind the individuals who have a court date when their court date is, and, and it's a volunteer program. So it's been working so far. Um, you know, statistically, I can't tell you the exact numbers, but it's been working, and we've been lucky so far. So we're hoping um, that everything still falls in line. And I know there's a, the Bose case out there that the Supreme Court has written on, and uh, that now the legislatures are talking about how to add that equation to our mix. And we're, we're as a court, dealing with every curveball we get thrown. So we're dealing with it. Hi, I know we're short for time, so I'll try to be quick with this question. Um, two data questions. The first is, are you documenting on truth and sentencing? And what that means is, is that we're charging criminal defendants based upon the factual allegations of the case versus something that varies, um, a, a very different charge, and so that we can study the racial and income disparities between which criminal defendants are offered which plea bargains. And then secondly, can you share with us the data on the number of individuals who are in the county jail that suffer a mental illness, and that may have been the cause for their violent felony? You know, um, I can't give you that data information, but I can tell you, um, yes, um, as for tracking uh, pleas and truth in sentencing, I think is your statement. Um, you know, we have been part of the pilot program from the Supreme Court. I know one of our judges here, Judge Rick Bell, has been doing the uniform sentencing entry. Um, and he, her, him and Ashley Cobain, and we have our uh, Judge John Russo, we have a lot of our judges signed up as the pilot courts to to track that information, that's the uniform sentencing entry. I've not seen the results of that data. Um, we're working with the Supreme Court on that, and we'll see how that uh, how that comes out. Um, but definitely something to look at. As for our mental health cases, um, I'm telling you what, our mental health docket, our judges work very hard to uh, to make sure that people who are mentally ill in our court aren't sitting in the court, that they've got a treatment plan, they're receiving their medications, they're not just sitting in a jail. Um, I think under Judge John Russo's uh, uh, tenure, um, he said it best, um, at that time, I think our county jail was like a mental health institution, and we needed to change that. And our mental health judges have been working with our uh, specialty docket uh, coordinator, Megan Patton, to make sure people do not sit in that jail because of mental health issues, that they're getting the treatment, they're getting their, their, their programming, that they're hooked up with services, so they're not um, sitting in jail waiting for resolution. So I think that's it. There's one more on Zoom we want to ask. Sure. Okay. If the court has instituted release on personal recognizance for many charges, why has the jail population increased and people accused of lower level charges are still having to remain in jail for weeks and months? I don't think that's accurate. Um, the, uh, I believe that uh, the low level felony cases that are in our county jail at this time are there because of other holders or other issues. And when I say other holders, I mean other holders from other jurisdictions, um, adult parole holders, whatever that they, they are other cases that they're in there for. But there's not, we've looked and we've monitored those low level felony cases. And I can tell you that they don't languish in our jail very, very long. And I think the average is, the average if they're in the county jail is less than 20 days, I think it is, and I, I, I that's a speculate, I, I can't, I see this graphs, I just can't remember what it was. All right. All right, thank you, Judge. Good, Shane. does that mean I did okay? Three questions, four <laughs> questions? <laughs> Thanks.
Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, I am actually, does this work? Okay, so what am I doing wrong? I am actually here on behalf of Tom O'Malley, who, there we go, who is our administrative judge, thank God. Um, I was the administrative judge and um, I uh, stepped down at the beginning of COVID. Um, so it's my pleasure to be here today. I want to zip through this presentation because I know that we've, you've all been listening very attentively for a long time. So the uh, first thing I want to talk about is our uh, juvenile court security project. Um, we do have, we have more, our building has more cameras than all of the rest of the county buildings combined, but apparently it's not enough. Um, so there is a new security system coming in with 90 cameras. Um, mainly in the detention center, um, but we are working on improving our security in the building. We are putting in a new detention center management system to keep both the kids and the staff um, safe. Um, this will interface with our IK system, our medical provider, and our phone provider. We are um, increasing our guardian ad litem fees so that all GAL work will now be paid at $60 an hour for both in-court and out-of-court work. And we have increased that maximum fee from $500 to $1,000. Um, the last time the guardian ad litems had uh, an increase, I believe, was in 2003. So that was well uh, deserved and well overdue. We are increasing our private docket, our private custody docket, which is our most uh, docket that is most behind, from three magistrates to six magistrates. Um, most of these cases are coming in pro se. They are extremely complicated for both the, the jurists who are presiding over them and for the people who are trying to make the system work. Um, so we do uh, have a diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we actually are... Um, working with an Equus group for monthly technical assistance to assess our policies and our leadership. Um, leadership in the court will be uh, attending training sessions. And then in year two of this program, uh, the staff will be trained throughout the court to make sure that everything we do is fair. Um, so I'm, I'm happy about that. And also, Boy, this is a challenging, yeah. We are uh, tracking what we call SOGI, SOGI data, which is um, an acronym that is used as it, only as it pertains to data collection. We received a technical assistance grant from the Cirrus Policy and Research to help the court begin obtaining this information um, to, it's collected in the intake interview process along with other demographic information. The iCase database has been updated to collect this data to identify programming to meet the needs of our LGBTQ plus population. And this data would also inform our policy by checking to see if there are disparities in the way we treat these kids. Um, we are trying to be a more culturally responsive and informed court. Um, we are um, working on our internship, externship program. Our chief legal counsel, Sarah Sidgick, is teaching juvenile law at Case, and I am co-teaching juvenile law at Cleveland Marshall, or Cleveland State College of Law with Bob Triazzi. Um, the juvenile court joined the CMBA minority clerk clerkship program, and we will have a clerk joining us this summer. So we are trying to increase opportunities um, for law students, every law student in our system. Um, Judge Patrick Corrigan, our firefighter, is retiring after 29 years at, at juvenile court. Um, I think he may be our longest or second longest serving judge on our bench. Um, he uh, is rare to come across someone who has served as long as him and nobody has a bad word to say about the man. That's a really rare quality. Um, he will be greatly missed at the court. 
Uh, Judge Floyd has been elected president of the Ohio Association of Juvenile Court Judges. I'm not sure that we've ever had that honor in uh, the history of our bench, and so we're all very proud of her. Um, this is, that's myself. I preside over the Phoenix Court Docket, which is the mental health court docket, and the family drug court docket. And then also, we have created a new docket this year called the Safe Babies Docket. So, so the, I will just tell you, I'm not going to talk a lot about how COVID has impacted our court policies. We're pretty much up and running as, as we always have been because it is very hard to assess whether or not children are being abused or whether or not uh, there's domestic violence in the home if you actually can't set eyes on kids. It's extremely important that we actually see the kids because this is the way that their attorneys can talk to them privately to really find out what's going on in the home. Um, but I will tell you that during the period of COVID, um, children and family services had to shut down in-person visitation. Well, you can't really do in-person uh, visitation with an infant or toddler over a screen. Um, it, it was a disaster. Um, I, I will also say, just generally speaking, going off script here, that the, the way COVID has impacted the children of our community has just been an absolute nightmare. Um, and we are going to be dealing with the consequences of that for years and years to come. So that kind of breaks my heart. Um, but anyway, I would just want to say, so the, the purpose of the Safe Babies is to um, change the way visitation happens so that it happens multiple times a week. And one of the ways that happens is by changing the relationship between biological parents and their foster caregivers so that they are working collaboratively together which has not been the model at all. It will definitely be challenging, but it's very interesting work. Um, Judge Ryan presides over our um, reentry program. Every child who is released from the uh, Ohio prison system is required to participate in reentry as a condition of their parole. The city of Cleveland partners with the reentry docket to provide mentorships and other incentives to youth are in, who are enrolled in this program. Judge Jennifer O'Malley oversees the Safe Harbor Docket, which is um, for the kids, boys and girls, who are uh, at victims of human trafficking or at risk of becoming trafficked. This is a diversion program, and they are eligible to have their charges dismissed. Um, she is also overseeing the Detention Center's gardening program. And she is leading an initiative with the Beck Center in Lakewood to create uh, a mural painted in the, within the juvenile detention center. It's very clean. The detention center is very clean, but it is very austere. If you have been in it, it's very hospital-like. Um, uh, the Promise Team is a new uh, program created to meet our high-end needs, uh, our girls. Um, we are coordinating with Children and Family Services. Um, they, uh, again, we have a high-end need population of girls, and so we are, are trying new things with that population. Um, we're trying to keep these children out of residential treatment. The Early Intervention Center came online. It, it was, became up and running really right before the pandemic hit. The idea is that um, under traditional court practices, your case is resolved and then you get services. Well, if you know anything about teenage brain science, you want to implement the services close in time to when they come to law enforcement's attention. So the Early di Intervention Center, the point of that is to, uh, as soon as a kid comes to the attention of law enforcement, they meet with an, an intervention specialist so that they can get services right away. And you can see, um, this is our, our chart here as to how that population has increased. And then some of our, our referrals overall are um, down. I'm not sure what will happen with that. Um, the other thing is to increase the rate of diversion. So I want to just point out here, one of the big things that has been an issue is do kids across the county have equal rates at diversion and intervention? And I just want to point out the high rate of red there right in the middle of the city. 
So yes, they do. Um, that has actually been, we, I will say we have worked with the uh, Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office to totally revamp the way every kid is charged and diverted so that every single kid in the county is handled the same way, which was not the case 10 years ago. Um, most of the kids who are referred to diversion um, are in fact most of our misdemeanors and unruly cases. Um, so our delinquency docket is dropping a, by a lot because most of our kids, and this has always been true, are one and done. So if you're only going to have one criminal case, then why do you even need to have that one? If we can provide you with services through an intervention center, why do we need to formally charge you at all if you can be successful um, with completing your services? And so again, I just I want to I want to emphasize here, as you see, most of our kids are successful. Um, and again, you know, we, we really appreciated the prosecutor's office involvement in this. Um, most of the kids don't come back. Um, it's been really successful. And again, I really want to say the way we are front-loading services, I think, also increases our rates of success. Um, this is another program that I've actually worked on. Um, this was driven almost entirely at the beginning by the Rape Crisis Center. So um, I, I am just going to tell you that we have a lot of sex offense cases in juvenile court, and most of them are within the family. And a huge percentage of them are children who are the perpetrators are under the age of 14. And what rape crisis was seeing was people completely unwilling to acknowledge what was going on within their own families because they were afraid of the consequences for their children. Who were, who were the offenders. So nothing was happening. And so that is a terrible outcome. So Rape Crisis asked us if we could create a diversion program so that everybody would get treatment and that the victims would be acknowledged, neither of which was happening. So we, uh, Rape Crisis and myself and the prosecutor's office and then the public defender's office spent several years putting this program together. And um, we thought we would have maybe 8 to 15 children in it. By the end of the first year, we had 40 children in it. Um, we're over 100. There's a lot more of this than you could possibly imagine. Um, but the uh, program has been hugely successful. Um, so we are doing a lot of in-family um, therapy. Again, if you, if you are trying to change the children, but you don't change their parents, it's not going to work. So the idea of a lot of our services are working within the home with the entire family. Um, it's, it's been very successful, as you can see here from this uh, slide. Um, we, haven't, we haven't had almost any out, I mean, bad outcomes. We've had you know, some people that haven't, uh, two, we've had two people that haven't succeeded in the program. Um, again, this is our sex offender therapy treatment. Um, most of that, I, I know this is you know, a controversial area. I know a lot of people believe that sex offenders cannot be rehabilitated in juvenile court. That's just not true. Most of, most of them, most people are. Um, substance abuse, it's, it's the same thing. Um, we haven't really, again, and I, I'm grateful for this, have not been struck by um, the opioid epidemic on our delinquency docket, our custody docket is a com completely different thing, but our kids are not involved as much as I know some other areas of the state of Ohio have been with the deep end substance abuses. So that's good. Daisy House is really what has become our sort of our shelter care, which is where kids are housed if they do not meet the very strict criteria to get into the detention center, but they can't, for whatever reason, be kept safely at home. Um, our clerk's office, so as you can see, we're a very busy court, and um, we're trying to improve our clerk of courts, mainly by helping our clerks feel more appreciated. Um, we, uh, we have promoted, Tim McDivitt is now our court administrator since Tess Neff is now the Lakewood 
uh, municipal judge, and Van Ward and Bridget Gibbons were just made our deputy court administrators as of this week. Um, Janine Nickerson um, is our director of our uh, new leadership team in our clerk's office. And um, in the detention center, we were grateful um, and very, at one point, very concerned when they talked about raising the salaries for the uh, detention officers in the county jail that we were going to get left behind, and then all of our staff would leave to go to the county jail. So we were grateful to be able to work with the county administration and county council to achieve parity in our corrections offices, our salaries with the correction offices downtown. Um, so all of our kids are in, involved in schooling in the detention center. Sometimes we get questions about this. Um, if you're not going to in-person instruction, you're doing re work remotely, um, when you do go to physical education. We do have a program. It had been suspended for a period of time um, for kids who have graduated from high school. And so um, that will be through Tri-C, and that is coming back up in May. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about, ironically, this is actually a pretty important thing for the kids, and that's um, hair care in the detention center. I just, wanna, I just want you to think about, this is one of the few opportunities that our kids in the detention center have to be touched, right? I mean, you know, that's a pretty, it's a pretty bizarre environment, um, and there's not a lot of opportunity for physical contact for these kids, but everybody needs physical contact if they're gonna grow up to be healthy human beings. So the hair care is one way that that, that can be achieved. And then finally, after a, a three-year hiatus, the John Carroll, the Carroll Ballers, are back in the detention center. Um, they are a group of, of motivated students from John Carroll University who come in every week and play basketball and eat pizza and talk to the kids. Um, it's a hugely popular program, as you can imagine. Um, it's hugely popular for the students at John Carroll, too. So uh, both the court and John Carroll is relieved that we have this program back up and running. And I want to thank you for your time and attention. It's been a pleasure to be here. Do you have any questions? I think we're good. Okay, okay great. Thank, thank thanks, you very Judge. much. Thank you to uh -huh. all of our judges who participated today. Thank you all for coming. And at this time, we're going to adjourn to the balcony for refreshments. Yes, thank you, Megan. Thank you, Nick. Um, thank you all for being here. First drinks on us. So see Becky or Melanie. We've got drink tickets. Come talk. Be merry. Uh, everyone for CLE, your survey will be emailed to you. So nothing to do this evening, Zoom and in person. Thank you.